The more we know about the structure of sleep and all of the behaviors associated with sleep it will help us develop new ways to intervene and increase the quality of sleep. Human OS. Learn. Master. Achieve. Okay, Professor Luis de la Sea, thank you for joining Human OS Radio. My pleasure. Let's start off and tell us a little bit about how you got into sciences, particularly how you started to study sleep and sleep circuitry. Yeah, it's actually an interesting story, I think. <laughs> I got into science through molecular biology at heart. I started, of course, doing science in the late 80s. And uh, at that time, the hype was biochemistry, microbiology. Of course, the genome had not been sequenced yet. Mm -hmm. And my main interest was to determine which genes were making up the brain. So it was a very naive approach, of course, back then. So I set up to investigate how many cell types, how many types of neurons there were in the brain. And uh, at the time, the uh, technology was rather limited, uh, but I was very attracted by this uh, technology called subtractive hybridization, uh, which allowed to compare different populations of neurons, the transcriptome of different populations of neurons. Okay. And that was really what my thesis was all about, to try to identify different markers for different uh, cell types in different brain areas. And where did you do that work? I started in Belgium, I continued in Barcelona, and I wrapped it up in San Diego. Great. So I continued postdoctoral work with the same philosophy of trying to identify markers of different cell types in the brain. And then I came up with this very interesting molecule, which was a putative neuropeptide, and that was expressed exclusively in the neocortex. So we call this molecule cortistatin, because it was expressed in the cortex, and it was similar to uh, another neuropeptide called somatostatin. Mm -hmm. Then I had no idea about how to study the function of this molecule, so I asked my lab mate, so how could I study the function of a molecule that is expressed only in the cortex? And someone suggested, well, you should learn how to do EEG. And then I approached someone in the lab next door who had done EEG, and that's really how I got introduced into the sleep world. Yeah. It's always interesting to ask because sleep has really grown as a field that has attracted a lot of great researchers over the last 20 to 30 years, but it's not an obvious track for a lot of people. I think maybe nowadays it's more so, but even back then it was still emerging in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. I was extremely lucky to find Steve Henriksen and his associates uh, were really incredibly open to teach me the basics of sleep, where they did a lot of the experiments for me at the beginning, and they taught my students then. So it was really a coincidence to have these experts next to me. So you've recently published some very exciting work connecting the reward system with arousal systems. But before we get into that, there's a few other things I'd like to talk about about your background. One of them is the research that you've done revolving around narcolepsy. Very important work identifying critical aspects that helped advance the field of narcolepsy. And then secondly, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the newer techniques that you're using to do some of this work because they're very cutting edge. A lot more scientists know about them. General population does not, but it's absolutely science fiction-like. That was the hypocretin orexin work was immediately followed the cortisatin work. So that was, uh, again, with the idea of finding markers of specific brain regions. In that particular study, we focused on the hypothalamus. Yeah. And yes, indeed, one of the first molecules that came up from that screening was a very attractive gene expression pattern, just restricted to the hypothalamus. But again, we had no idea what this molecule was doing. And we suggested that it could be involved in the thermal regulation and maybe sleep and arousal. That was just speculation at that time. But only a couple of years after that uh, study came out, uh, then uh, Yana Gizawa published this uh, cell paper in which he had knocked out this gene, and uh, he found that the mice were narcoleptic. And then, you know, Mignot, following up this uh, discovery, showed that uh, narcoleptic dogs also have this gene, and mm -hmm. a whole bunch of discoveries followed up after that. So it was really an amazing privilege to be part of this set of discoveries. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> Not every scientist gets to make a discovery that leads to understanding a disease that much better than we did previously. So kudos to your work on that. So let's talk a little bit about, I mentioned this very interesting science fiction-like technique, optogenetics. You've done a lot of work in that area. I've done a lot of talks about it, but can you tell us a little bit about what it is? Sure. Well, optogenetics was a technique uh, that is based on and the discovery of this molecule that responds to uh, blue light. And this molecule was originally found in algae, in blue algae. And the uh, groups in Germany and here in Stanford hypothesized that this molecule in, in algae could be introduced into neurons to make them sensitive to light. And that was a, a great idea. So when I joined Stanford, uh, Carl Dijkstraat, who was an assistant professor then, had just published a paper showing that indeed he could render neurons sensitive to blue light in culture. 
And that was a fantastic tool that needed to be implemented in vivo. And the reason why we thought it was interesting was because before optogenetics, the only way to manipulate brain activity was either through an electrode, which would give you the precision of the location of the electrode, but it would not know which cells you're stimulating or recording from. And the other alternative method would be pharmacology, which provides specificity, but it doesn't provide the temporal resolution. And when you study sleep, you need actually both. You need to know where you're recording from and you know cell type and a good temporal resolution because the sleep cycles in rodents are relatively short. So that's really what drove us to try optogenetics in the first place. And uh, indeed, that was the first paper. Antoine uh, was a postdoc in my lab, uh, and Fang Zhang, who was a grad student back then in Carl's lab, uh, worked together to manipulate these uh, hyperkinorexin cells in the hypothalamus and demonstrate that these cells were very important to facilitate the transition between sleep and wakefulness. Yeah. And just for the audience, if they don't understand what temporal resolution means, can you describe that? Sure. Temporal resolution means that we can manipulate the activity of those uh, neurons within milliseconds. And that is the uh, physiologically relevant timescale for neurons. Got it. The original discovery was that there are these blue light sensitive cells. You could then actually put these into neurons and then use light to then activate the neurons, which was better than the techniques that were used previously. You had better specificity, better time resolution. And so you could start to then discover new aspects about neurons and neuron functioning that was heretofore impossible. That's correct. And yeah, I forgot to mention that the beauty of this is that you can express this molecule in genetically identified neurons. And in this case, we chose to target these hypercritical anorexin neurons. And what this does is really to define functionally a neural circuit. And that has really revolutionized the neurobiology in the last 10 years. Yeah. So you could see for a particular behavior, all the different neurons that are firing together to make that behavior or brain activity, the functional unit that happens. That's exactly right. You can identify the functional unit underlying a specific behavior. Incredible. So on that note, recently, this month, in fact, you guys published a paper in Nature Neuroscience, right? Yes. Yeah. And this is looking at the connection between the reward system and arousal circuits. So tell us a little bit about the thinking that went into the design of the study originally. What were the connections that you were interested in that made you think that there was something here? Yeah, that's, uh, again, an, another surprising story because it was surprising to us that uh, nobody had uh, looked at the activity of these uh, reward uh, neurons uh, across the sleep-wake cycle. Intuitively, these neurons had to be involved in sleep and wakefulness because uh, amphetamines and uh, psychostimulants are well known to induce wakefulness and maintain wakefulness for long periods of time. We were surprised that uh, there was no direct proof that that was the case. And that's uh, when we used optogenetics to stimulate these dopaminergic neurons, those neurons that express dopamine that are mainly regarded as the main driver behind the reward and brain function. So uh, she found that indeed when she stimulated those cells, the animals would not only wake up, but they would maintain wakefulness for very long periods of time. So the optogenetics could almost act like amphetamine was given. Amphetamine, cocaine, it was exactly the same. Yeah. The beauty of optogenetics is, as you mentioned earlier, uh, the millisecond temporal resolution allowed us to define the minimal amount of uh, activity that was sufficient to maintain wakefulness for very long periods of time. And amazingly, with you know, 500 milliseconds, one second per minute was sufficient to maintain wakefulness in mice for six hours or longer. Interesting. So listener, instead of giving amphetamines or drugs to activate these circuits, light pulses are given to these special neurons that are in these mice that are genetically engineered, and it's having an equivalent effect. That's exactly right. Keeping them up. Okay, so that was the connection, and a group of researchers in your lab set up these mice. What was the study actually like to evaluate this circuit? Yeah, so the actual surprise came immediately after, because these days it's essential not only to provide proof of sufficiency, but also journals want to see necessity. That means that what happens when you inhibit those neurons. So does inhibiting those neurons actually inhibit the behavior? And that was the follow-up experiment. And to our surprise, when we inhibited these dopaminergic cells, the animals went to sleep. Mm. And that had not been described before. Right. So, yeah, then the whole new set of questions were raised, like, well, if we inhibit brain reward, well, maybe the animals get bored, and that's why they fall asleep. So then we challenged the animals uh, with a whole set of stimuli that normally you know, make them more alert or make them more mm. aroused. And those include either an opposite sex animal, conspecific, and then also uh, palatable food or the other of predator like fox urine. Mm -hmm. Under these circumstances, the animals would explore the environment but would still fall asleep. Mm. 
So even in the presence of things that usually keep them awake, like the delicious tasting food, the smell of opposite sex mice, or the smell of a predator, they usually stay awake when they're in an environment that has those things, but instead they slept, even when those things were present. That's correct. There was another surprise, which was that when we inhibited dopamine, but we transferred the animals to a new cage, the animals would not fall asleep. Hmm. And that was somewhat puzzling because hmm. that meant that changing the cage was more arousing than other of a predator. That really didn't make any sense to us. Yeah, right. When you're inactivating these neurons, can you inhibit them only a certain amount or is it really more like an on-off switch or can you affect the strength of how much you're turning them on or off? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, indeed, you can tune the inhibition in several ways, and it doesn't have to be on and off. But you know, the more conditions you try, the more complex the experiment becomes. So uh, yeah. for these particular conditions, we just tried on and off. Sure. So uh, mentioning before, what we did was then to change the animals to a new cage. You know, the animals that had dopamine inhibited would not go to sleep. They were very active, actually. Hmm. So we were puzzled with this finding until uh, Ada, who was the leading author on the paper, realized that what the animals were doing was actually building a nest. Mm -hmm. Compared to the control mice, the control mice would not touch a nestlet, which is the building material for a nest. When the control animals were transferred to a new cage, they would just explore the new cage, running around, running around, and would not touch these nestlets. Mm. However, the animals that were treated with these for, to inhibit dopamine neurons, they would exclusively devote it to building a nest, and then they would fall asleep. Interesting. So the animals that had their dopamine neurons turned off and the VTA in one environment where there is usually arousing stimuli, they would just sleep. But when those mice were transferred to a different cage, they didn't sleep right away, but all of the activity was devoted to then creating a sleeping area for themselves. That's exactly what happened. And even to our surprise, when we transferred the uh, mice along with the old nest in the old home cage, then the animals would fall asleep immediately. So if there was a nest already built, the animals would fall asleep immediately. Oh, interesting. So you would think that nest building might leverage the reward system, but this would indicate that it doesn't. So that seems to be a goal-directed behavior, which is what dopamine is typically used for, these fueling goal-directed behaviors. So does that indicate that there's a separate circuit for nest building that's not related to brain reward? Well, I think it is connected to brain reward because it only appears when dopaminergic cells are inhibited. Ah, yeah, okay. So it's like an on-off switch, like turning off uh, dopamine cells unleash this, this behavior that is conducive to sleep. I see, yeah. So it's not that it's separate, it's actually facilitated by its inactivity. Yes, exactly. Okay, that's so interesting. <laughs> I'm trying to think about how that would make sense. If you're using your dopamine system for a little while, it becomes taxed perhaps, and then its inactivity will usher in a new set of behaviors that helps you go to sleep, and then it restores, and then you can do more goal-directed behavior once you're awake. Yeah, that opens up, again, a whole set of new questions. Totally. To us, it's very interesting the fact that this sort of preparatory phase for sleep had not been described before, at least related to dopamine. And that prompts us to investigate whether interfering with this preparatory phase would actually affect the quality of subsequent sleep and whether really to define exactly what kind of brain patterns and behavioral patterns are conducive to sleep. That I think is a very new and intriguing question. Yeah, that does seem like it could potentially lead to novel therapeutics that would facilitate sleep behaviors other than benzodiazepines. That's correct. And I think that any alternative to benzodiazepines would be great to investigate. Our hypothesis now is that if we deliver short-lived dopaminergic antagonists that facilitate this preparatory phase, then you would make a much better hypnotic than benzodiazepines. Yeah, interesting. Aside from just the changing the behaviors around sleep, did you notice that sleep was deeper or anything related to sleep quality? We analyzed sleep quality and it was undistinguishable from a good night's sleep. So it was just a balanced, full-blown sleep. There were no pharmacological signatures of that sleep. So that is a good thing. That's good news, yeah. Did you happen to also then notice what their behavior was like after sleep occurred? Yeah, that was perfectly normal. And there's nothing, no inertia, nothing that make us worry about intervening in that sense. So I think there's, again, potential. There's also the biological question of what does this mean in terms of ecology and ethology? What kind of behaviors are related to this preparatory phase and how important how relevant these are for the physiology and the well-being of the animal. What's the next step to follow up on this research? Well, there are several interesting questions. I think one is actually to define exactly which neurons are uh, responsible for this nest building behavior. We know that they're turned on by dopaminergic inhibition, but we don't know exactly which cells these are. And of course, we need to identify them. 
And we have some ideas about what kind of cells this might be, but this is work in progress. And then, like I said, I'm intervening with this preparatory phase pharmacologically and see how sleep is affected. And then, as I said, the third line of research would be to integrate this into which other behaviors are related to this preparatory phase Mm -hmm. and which other transmitters may be activated or inhibited during this preparatory phase. Wow, that's fascinating. I can't wait to see the follow-up studies on that. I agree with you that the benzodiazepines and non-benzodiazepine-like drugs that facilitate sleep now that are the most common remedies for people that can't get the sleep that they want have a lot of issues with them. So novel therapeutics that could address sleep in a different way, perhaps in a more targeted way, and also in a way with less consequences is really, really desirable. There's a thousand applications that I can think of where people could really benefit from this. So I hope it pans out. Yeah, thank you. I hope so, too. I think that the more we know about the structure of sleep and all of the behavior associated with sleep will help us develop new ways to intervene and increase the quality of sleep, which is one of our goals. Yeah, another great discovery. Dr. De La Saya, thank you for your time today and discussing this with us. It's really appreciated. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening and come visit us soon at humanos.me.